good to have you here. Today is another day the Lord has made. We should rejoice, and you need to rejoice sometimes in it, no matter what's going on around us and how things are uh, being thrown up here and there, and uh, economically and politically, and the warfare's out here in the streets, and things that are going on, and crime increasing. And here we are, the people that are to know the Lord and follow Him. So we're going to talk about the cross this morning. And what I title today is Don't Discard the Cross. Amen. Hey, listen, if somebody's saying you didn't need Jesus to die on the cross for you, I want you to understand if you take that mindset, you don't have any salvation. You don't have any forgiveness of sin from the beginning of time. When did God realize or when did God make it known that we were going to need a cross, we were going to need a savior, we were going to need somebody to pay the price for our sin. Do you remember when he did that? The Bible says before the foundation of the world in the book of Revelation, the lamb was slain. In other words, God already knew back then you and I were going to need a savior. That's before this popular religion stuff ever came out. Why a lot of folks don't want to be in some ministry in some churches is because it doesn't fit with, well, you know, I can do it on my own. And I'm wonderful in myself. And I'm the best me I'm ever going to be. Well, listen, if you haven't been crucified, like Paul said, being crucified with Christ, you're never going to see any of that. Amen. You may be great in the world, but you're not great in the eyes of God. Amen. Because as Christ took up his cross... Every one of us is to take up our cross. And listen, you may have gone a long time, but Paul said, I die daily. Are you still dying daily to your own desires and lusts and things that you say, I'm going to get, I'm going to have, I'm going to be? Are you still dying to all of that? Because every day is a challenge. Amen. That's why every day is a day that the Lord has made. So that you and I, every day, we are overcoming because... Christ overcame. Yes. How do we overcome? The Bible says again, by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. No sacrifice, no cross, no blood. There's no overcoming without it. This is what we've got to be rooted and grounded and founded in. Many of you said here, well, a lot of them aren't here today, but uh, many of you said last week, I really felt moved by what was said. I felt convicted by what was said. I need to make changes because of what was said. But how much of that have you done in the week? We take a lazy attitude because the only one who's really watching us is God. He's the only one looking into our hearts. And so if we don't get anything immediately like God brings lightning in our life, well, I still have a lot of time. And we don't have a lot of time. Amen. Today could be my last day. Hey, I could not even maybe finish a service or a message or whatever. I could be out of here. And you too. Yeah. That's why yesterday at uh, our sister's uh, gathering there for her son going home to be with the Lord, I said to all those folks, listen, the Bible says you need to know the Lord. Yeah. Your life will change when you know the Lord. Amen. When Christ has come into your heart by faith, as the word says, you don't desire what you used to desire. Right. And we'll talk about Jesus laying down his reputation yeah. as God yeah. and suffering at the hands of sinful men so that he could save us. Amen. That Bible tells us he didn't just die for us. He died the death of the cross. Yeah. Yeah. The worst of the worst. You're a vagabond, you're a sinner, you're a thief, you're a liar, you're a cheat. Those were the people that hung on the cross, enemies of ours. And they didn't get like we sometimes see now, which even this seems inhumane, but you give a guy an injection and he goes to sleep and never wakes up. Amen. I would say probably if you said... To somebody at that point in time, would you like us just to shoot you up and that's it, you stop breathing? Or would you like to hang out there on the cross, naked in front of everybody, ravaged 
with the beatings and the things that they did to you and the mockery and hanging in the sun to where you're, you're dehydrated and you're already bleeding and everything else, which one would you take? Just give me the shot and put me to sleep. Nobody sees me. There's no embarrassment. People aren't walking down the street going, aha, aha. The Pharisees and the priests aren't going to say, come down from there, come down from there. No, in a minute it's gone. You're done. Your suffering's over. So when it says, excuse me, that he suffered the death of the cross, that's not just a statement. There's a whole story. There's a whole background. There's a whole understanding of he could have just took the injection if he was in today's day. But he was willing to suffer for us and die for us. He was willing to go to the lowest point of what men envisioned so that he could be raised to glory. Amen? Our reputations as people may get totally destroyed. But listen, you don't live by a reputation. Amen. You live by what is in you. Yes. And if Christ is in you and the power of God is in us, our reputation doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't mean we say, hey, whatever I do, I do. It doesn't matter. No, that's not the fact whatsoever. But when people attack you, when people speak evil, when they mound up together and think things and spread things and so on, that's not what we're living for. He said all who live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. And yet we in the American church think can't happen in America. I'm sure when you listen to these political debates, a lot of parties never thought somebody would say, just because you're that party, you're evil and wicked, or you're that party, you deserve to die. But look what's happening. The hearts of men are being revealed more and more. That's why we talked about last week and the week before, love not the world, neither the things that are in it. Because all these things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they are not of God. Amen. Though men strive for them, and people who profess Christ chase after them, it's not of God. It's not what God intended. Yet so many of these New Age guys and these progressive guys and so on will tell you that this is all going to be wonderful. I won't go into all that. I did that last week. This morning, I want you to open your Bibles. Uh, and by the way, good morning to those of you that are listening in. We've been really blessed. There's a lot of folks listening in out there. I wish you could come and be with us if that's possible and you're close by here. You know you're welcome to come. We're here every Sunday morning at 1045 the same time. John chapter 12, verse 23. Remember, Jesus had done a lot of miracles. He'd walked with the people. He'd, he'd gone back and forth a little bit with some of the religious order who didn't agree with what he thought and what he said. They didn't like him because he was from Nazareth. Uh, they, you know, said, hey, you know, no man can be the Savior. You rem remember all that? And the funny thing is today they're looking for a man to be the Savior. When our Bible tells us he's not coming from this earth, he's coming from the clouds of glory to, be the, to show himself uh, in the end here. So Jesus answered saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, doesn't that mean when we think about glorified, somebody's going to pick me up and set me on a throne back here and everybody's going to bow down and say, hey, you're wonderful, you're great. But that wasn't the glorified he's talking about. He's talking about the glorified by the cross, by paying the price, by judging this world where it is because he knew the world was wicked. He knew the hearts of men had taken over governments and mindsets and ethnicities and everything else and the raging of people. Today we want to say everybody's wonderful and everybody's great. But that goes totally against what God said. He said today the Son of Man should be glorified. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you that except a corner of quarter of, excuse me, a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. <clears throat> so I meant to grab my garlic. I have a, a bulb of garlic in the room there. I was going to bring one of the cloves in and set it up here. We'll, we'll pretend it, this is the garlic or the corn of wheat that we're talking about. And you could talk about a, a kernel of uh, corn itself. So this cap, we'll just say, represents that clove of garlic. You all know what garlic does, right? Amen. Okay, it doesn't keep vampires away, but it keeps flu and viruses and, you know, things like that away. So we'll say this is, uh, you can't see this on the camera there, but I've just set it on the counter here. I'm just going to set it there as a clove of garlic, and let's watch by the end of the service what it does. Right? He said, except that kernel or corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Mm -hmm. So this garlic at the end of church today will still just be sitting here on the counter all by itself. Amen. Right? Amen. But I don't know how many of you plant garlic, but if you take that garlic and plant it in the ground next month in the summertime, you will have planted one clove of garlic, but you'll have maybe up to 12 cloves of garlic that grow from that, right? Amen. And if you pay a little more attention and leave it in the ground, say you don't really need all that garlic or you let the main stem stay in the ground, you'll notice that at the top you have 60 little tiny garlic seeds because it's gone into the ground and died and it's brought forth the fruit that it talks about. This is the glory that Jesus Christ was talking about. Nobody's going to enthrone him. Nobody's going to get him to be the king and the leader. But God is going to make him the head above all. And the king above all. Amen. And reign over all. Because he was willing to die. So he said this, the time has come, the hour has come, the son of man should be glorified. I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and dieth, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. You and I as a person, you're always defending yourself. You're always ready to fight somebody at the drop of a hat. Whether I mean physically fight or combat verbally, because you haven't died to yourself. You're not going to bring forth any fruit. Unless you die. Sometimes the greatest thing you can do. Is just let somebody have at you. And say at the end. I'm sorry you feel that way. Or you may misunderstand me. And if you think that way about me. I'm sorry. But it's not true. And go on with your life. Because dying to ourselves is where we bring forth fruit. Jesus died, the physical man, Jesus, died in the flesh. Let them persecute him, belittle him, ravage him. And he, more than anybody else on the earth, knew they were more guilty, or they were guilty, because he was not guilty whatsoever. They were guilty of adultery, fornication, of robbery and thefts, and everything else. Yet they were the ones that were going to put him on the cross. They were, going to want, they were going to be the ones that would mock him and ridicule him and spit on him. And take his garments and cast lots for, for his clothing and so on. All those things. But he had died to himself. That wasn't what was important anymore. It wasn't a matter of what you think about me. If I've done no wrong, God is my vindicator. God is my avenger. God is the one who judges the hearts of men. In fact, the Bible tells us that we should judge no man before the time. Judge nothing before the time. Although we judge everything we do whether it's right and wrong, good or evil, uh, the way things are going on in life. We're to judge all these things. 
but we're not to condemn anybody in it. That judgment when he says that you judge no man is that you don't condemn them or damn them or put them in a category they will, they can never change because God can change them like that. Amen. Just like Saul of Tarsus, when light came down from heaven, light can come down to every one of us. Amen? Amen. So if that corn of wheat falls into the ground, it, or doesn't fall into the ground, it abides alone, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And that doesn't mean we got a rotten outlook on ourselves, and it doesn't mean that we're a better you or a better me than I've ever been before. It means we realize we are lost. We are sinners. We deserve hell and every bit of punishment that comes with it. But thank God for Jesus because he took our wrath and the punishment on the cross. You know, a lot of men are confusing this with Jesus took all the sin on himself. And so they're saying, listen to me, they're saying Jesus before he died was a pedophile. Jesus before he died was a thief and a liar, a pervert. Because he took sin on himself. He didn't take the sin. He took the wrath, the punishment for the sin and died for us. He took God's anger at what the enemy had done. Do you know in all actuality, you can look at even in the Old Testament, the law was a savior. Amen. The law would keep men from death. The second death. But the law could not cause them to love God. It could only keep them from the evil and the sin. You and I, when he says we have a much better covenant, we have somebody that we've accepted who helps us keep the law, Romans, by the Spirit, and yet causes us to love God at the same time. Because we understand that he died for us while we were yet sinners because he loved us. He says that he that um, loveth his life shall lose it. One day I laid down my life, what I was known for and everything else. And I remember being ridiculed. I, uh, yesterday I saw some of the young men I used to coach in uh, Warren Little President's football and I don't know if they would remember it, but I sure remember when the head coach hawkered and spit on my shoes and said, don't you talk about Jesus anymore? When I first came to the Lord, in front of all these parents and people that were known all over town in their businesses and so on, I remember a lot of stuff back then. It's like it was yesterday because back then I was hurt by it. But I came to realize by listening to the preaching and the teaching, if I'm going to serve the Lord, my life's dead. Amen. I'm not defending myself anymore. Paul didn't say I stand in defense of myself. He said, I stand in defense of the gospel. This is where we're at now, if we've really been changed by Christ. So if we will love our life, we're going to lose it. In other words, if I had said, and I could have done this, my family name was well known around town, one of the big real estate companies, and all my uncles and my father and grandfather, and I could have said, hey, I'm one of those people. You can't talk to me like that. Well, I'm one of them when I come to church. Well, you should hear me more than anybody else because I got a name in the community. We're known for this. We're business people. We, you know, we got whatever. And I was once accused of not liking my family or my family name and why are you doing that? I didn't dislike my family or my family name. I didn't want to use my family name as justification for where I was at or what I did. Amen. I wanted to serve the Lord so many times I would talk to somebody about Jesus. I would just tell them my first name. I never told them who I was because I didn't want that to be some kind of thing. I was dead to myself. 
And even now, I've had some people say some things. I just, well, I just have to let you think what you think. If you ask me, I just want you to know those things aren't true. All kinds of things go on with all kinds of us. Amen. There are wild imaginations that happen in the hearts of men. And the Bible tells us that. That's why he said, for you and I that believe in Jesus Christ, we're to have this power working in us that we can cast down vain imaginations and things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Amen. So if we love our life, we'll lose it. And one day you're going to get to the end of all this and find out you were wrong. And it's better to find out you're wrong when you just left your house to go on a trip than to find out after you've driven for six or seven hours in the wrong direction. Isn't that true? Okay, you went a couple blocks out of the way. It takes you a minute to turn around. Six or seven hours. Uh, I was at a place here in southern Ohio a couple weeks ago, and I was getting back on the freeway, and it said east or west, and I'm thinking, I don't remember exactly where I'm at here. Do I want to go east or west? So I drove for like 40 minutes and realized I saw a sign that said further out west there, Lodi, which I know where Lodi is. That's off 71 there. I don't want to go that way. So I turned around and drove back, and so I said, well... I haven't seen this area for quite a while. I guess <laughs> it's whatever. But I was going the wrong direction. And people in life are going the wrong direction. Yeah. It's better that somebody stops you. Uh, my son and I were driving. We were talking about a state highway patrolman. He saw walk out on the highway and stop a car. I mean, that's dangerous. But he stopped him. Well, I won't even go there. Don't get stopped by a state highway patrolman standing in the roadway. Uh, somebody I worked with one time forgot to renew their license plate stickers, and they were a car dealer. So it wasn't just that one car. It was all six cars or five cars that were following each other that had expired stickers. So there's a state highway patrolman up there on that big Cuyahoga River Bridge going on 480, I think it is, or the turnpike, I forget which one. And he's out there in the middle of the road going like this, and you pull over, you pull over, you pull over. All of us pull over. There we are in a line on the side of the road. I just thought I'd throw that in there in case you're going the wrong direction and you get stopped by a statey and he stops you early. Turn around and get on the right road. I just thought I'd throw that in there. That had nothing to do with it. So listen, and it says, And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. In other words, it's a more glorious life. It's a life hereafter. If we can put down ourselves and submit to the gospel and to Christ, it means it's not just going to be my best life now in this world. It's eternal life. It's dwelling with God forevermore, not in the darkness, not in the judgment, not in the wrath, not in those things. You know, can you take and put a drop of water, uh, take your finger and put a drop of water on my tongue? It's not going to be those things. It's life eternal. And listen, like everything else, we have to work to keep what we have Amen. in Christ. That's why the Bible tells us that we're in a warfare. That's why it tells us we need the weapons of warfare. That's why it tell us, tells us we need to overcome. And listen, no matter what age you are and everything else, if you have just become sort of the word slothful, sluggardly, uh, you know, if you now just you're being occupied with so many other things, listen, you need to pay attention. That's all part of the battle. It may not sound like swords clashing together or gunfire but you know there's been a lot of times where a guy just took a sip of tea and that sip of tea was from the enemy and you read about it in the paper they were poisoned no gun no swords clashing no real outward look of warfare or anything else but they were done that was the end of it all so if we hate this life, 
in the world. And a lot of folks have a hard time with that. Well, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? What it means is that what we're living, we now live for Christ. The way we walk, we now walk according to the scripture. Amen. That Christ has changed our hearts and our mindset to where we don't, we, oh, we can have a nicer house, we can need to move somewhere, we can need to get a new car and all these kind of things. We can make money, we can, but that's not what we live for. We live for the Lord. Amen. And in the midst of this, you know, when you begin to prosper sometimes, that's a hard place because you're always in that warfare of, but I can get more if I just do this. You know, and like how many people, uh, you know, if we just open on Sunday and don't go to church or Saturday, the Sabbath day, and don't go, well, we can make way more money and we can, you know, our kids will be better off and families. Well, listen, the God we serve created heaven and earth. You think he can't cause somebody to bless you with some money or bless your business on a time you never expected. You know, when I had the old food business there, we decided we were gonna close on Sundays, and I've shared this before, because we wanted to be in church because the rest of our life, we were living there. Amen. Uh, so I said, well, we're gonna close anyway, whatever happens, happens. Well, the next couple weeks, it was a little off, but then on Mondays, all of a sudden, we were getting busy that we never got before. And by the end of the week, we were doing just as much business as we ever did. And then I told you the stores by us, hey, how are you guys doing? Well, we're gonna close on Sunday too. So the Eastgate Pharmacy closed on Sunday after, what were they there, 50 years? And then the A&W across the street, uh, Lynn there, as she closed. You know, I see you guys are still doing okay. They closed on Sunday and all of a sudden, you know, everybody's starting to close on Sunday because somebody was faithful. I told you about a young, young, uh, young man whose father was a pastor, and I know him very well. They were winning their soccer match or championship thing, and so the last game's on Sunday. He told him, I'm sorry, we won't be there. Because of his son, who was one of the star players, they changed the whole league. You remember when we were younger, we played softball. We were winning a tournament. We gave the other team the victory and the championship because they put our game on Sunday. We weren't going to go. Now, today, that sounds totally, oh, my goodness, you guys were fanatics. But you know what? We were blessed in it. Amen. And a lot of good things happened from those times. Amen. Amen. I still attribute my wife and I being married for, what, 46 years, I think it is. I think it's the Lord. You can try to tell me it's my wife's a good person or I'm a good person or you had good blood or something like that. I'm sorry. I'm going to say it's the Lord no matter what. Amen. 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 Because we've tried to do what's right in his eyes. Have we always made that decision or, or kept it that way? Probably not, but we're going to keep trying. Amen. So. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. Man, everything we're talking about this morning. Do you feel like somebody's sitting right next to you, rubbing you and pushing you? Enjoy that feeling. Amen. That's a good thing. I know you got plenty of space. Like I said, I don't know how many folks are away somewhere, but I'm, I'm thinking in my head here. It, it doesn't matter. I hope they're listening in. But listen, we need to be rubbed. Yeah. Amen. We need to be reminded lots of times. We need to realize, listen, I could think in my mind, I've got it all down pat. And somebody says, well, hey, you, think, you were thinking this is black and it's actually yellow. Oh my gosh, I was looking at it wrong. I just had an experience like that. I won't go into it, but we'll talk about it sometime. Uh, something you never even thought of. And all of a sudden, it's a major problem in your life. He said, but if any man serve me, in verse 26, let him follow me. Follow me. It doesn't mean like we've said so many times and there's so many things out here. Just say, Jesus, you're going to heaven. He's not a magical word. Amen. He's not a wand you wave. He said, follow me. Where did he end up? Pardon me? 
He ended up at the cross, right? That was where we would be following him to. That's why he tells us to take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself in all these things. Amen. If any man serve me, are you saying you're serving him? Do you think in your mind you're serving him? Because if you do, he says, follow me. To think you're serving isn't enough. To say you're serving isn't enough. To say, hey, wait a minute, I'm garlic. And you smell like garlic. All right. But if you're not bearing fruit, if you're not bringing forth fruit, if you haven't died and been put in the ground, and isn't it funny the, gra the garlic doesn't get down there by itself? It's a good thing sometimes when people put us down because it helps us get down there where we're going to bear fruit. Yeah. yeah, I know the seeds will fall off the top if you've ever seen the shoots of garlic at the end there and then you see the bulb on top and the seeds pop out. It looks like a flower's going to bloom, but it doesn't. It all falls down, goes into the ground, and then in the spring you see these shoots all over the place. But sometimes you have to take the clove and stuff it in the ground and push it down a little bit. Sometimes we need push down. We need self dead. Amen. Some of these things that happen in our lives are the best things. We need to thank God for some of these trials we go through. Some of the things that seem to grieve us the most, that cause us to cry out to God. Yeah. I need you, Lord. Hey, man, I feel down in the dumps. I feel broken. I feel like I don't have a brain, whatever the case. Help me, Lord. Amen. And then all of a sudden, you remember the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. He's here with us. No matter what goes on, he's there to revive us and remind us and edify us. And sometimes he warns us, hey, don't go any further in that. It's not a good thing. And sometimes we plain flat out don't listen. Amen. Amen. If any man serve me, him. Did I miss part of that? Oh, if any man, back in 26, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. Do you know when a homeowner has a butler and the homeowner needs something, he expects the butler to be somewhere around, right? He expects to be able to ring the bell or say, Charles, and the butler comes because that's what he's there for. And that's what he's saying to, to us here. Uh, Follow me and where I am, there shall also my servant be. And listen, everybody, don't get off course in these things. What we do, we do as unto the Lord. I know a lot of folks, you could talk to them, it's social. It's just social. But you and I are to have the attitude in the heart that we do all things as unto the Lord. Amen. Right? Amen. And so to be mindful of that in everything we do. And I know a lot of folks, again, they're going to say, that's fanatical. That's too much. Well, listen, how many of you have been healed by God in here? And I know we have a lot of folks that aren't here. And I know some of them can give testimonies of the healing that they had. Listen, how much service is something like a healing like that worth? When David said, King David said, what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? You think about my salvation, my healing, my sound mind. I can actually think straight. Nobody dropped drugs in my drink or something or polluted my food and messed me up. Nobody shot me and killed me and, and now, or didn't kill me and now I'm, I'm maimed for the rest of my life or whatever. How much is all the benefit of God worth in service? You think about it when you marry a husband or a wife because you love them, you willingly serve them. You willingly go out of your way. I watched a video of a guy whose wife goes into these tremors and sometimes they last for 15 or 20 minutes He's got to just pick her up and hold her and try to keep her so she doesn't hurt herself. But he loves her. And isn't that what it should be? Amen. That you love somebody enough, you go through all that with them. Oh, you don't say, oh, these are wonderful tremors. You would say that's silly. 
It's a terrible thing. But you work with them all the way through because you love them. And that's what Christ has done for us. How many days could you say, man, I had some of those tremors going on in my head, in my heart. I thought God had vacated uh, from me, and yet the Lord brought me through. Where I am, there shall my servant be. If any man serve me, you could say right now, Lord, I'm willing to serve you, if that's what you're thinking. Him will my Father honor. Listen, I don't know what that honor is going to be. The Bible tells us, Paul said, there's a crown of life laid up for us uh, if we love his appearing. But whatever that honor is, if he just says hello, have you ever been shocked that somebody said hello to you like they knew you? Uh, We were talking again yesterday. I was saying about a fellow, a lot of you know his name is Guy. And one day somebody brought him to church here. And when they brought him in the front door, I went, hey, Guy, how are you? I had seen him at the gym or somewhere a couple times, and he came over and started talking to me and like he knew me, and I went, gosh, I don't know, do we really know each other? And here his name was Guy, and I didn't know that. I was saying, hey, Guy, like, hey, dude, or hey, man, or hey, boy, whatever. I said, hey, Guy, and I couldn't figure out why he was talking to me like he knew me. He thought I did know him, but I didn't. I think some of you went to his party yesterday. (laughs) And I've had his rib sauce. Uh, So if any man will serve me, him will my father honor. You know, if if you're in your prayer time, or as we're here in church, and I'm thankful to hear some of you that have been coming to prayer Saturday morning saying, I really believe the Lord met me. Well, you know what? He can meet you right now while we're talking. Remember, this is me talking. I know it's my voice and everything and my silly appearance, but it's the word of God. It's his word. It's his power. It's him that changes us. It's him that heals us and makes us whole. I'm just a delivery boy. You know, the guy riding down the street with the newspaper in the morning, you don't run out and hug him and kiss him. He's getting paid for what he does. You might give him a bonus somewhere down the line. And that's what we're doing here. We're serving the Lord, and that's what we all need to be doing. But look at what Jesus said. So after he edifies them, he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Jesus knows where he's going to be glorified, right? He knows it's the cross. He says, What shall I say? My soul is troubled. So shall I say, Father, save me from this hour. Hey, and you know what? You may get crucified more than once in life. But Lord, should I say, save me from this? You said you would cause all things to work to my good. And you said you can take every situation that I go through in this life and use it to your glory. Right? And so, Lord, what should I do here? How should I conduct myself? I know everything's going on right now, but here I am while everybody is looking and I'm silent, but I'm talking to you saying, Lord, what do you want in this? My soul is troubled. Thank God for troubled times. Because again, that's when we cry out to the Lord, when we realize more than ever we need him. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Now listen, Jesus, the Son of God, said, but for this cause came I to this hour. For this cause. This didn't just happen. You who may say that we never needed a Savior, we never needed a cross, we never needed the blood to be shed to atone for our sin. The Son of God himself said the reason he is coming to this place is for this cause, that he would be glorified. He knew we needed a Savior. He knew that before the foundation of the world. He knew we needed a way out of the wickedness that was in this earth. He knew that sin had corrupted all that he created on earth and that it needed to be restored. It needed to be reconciled back to the Father. 
Now is my soul troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Lord, you could save me from this. Remember, Jesus could have called legions of angels, Amen. right? Amen. But he didn't. In all reality, I don't think he needed to even call the angels. He could have stepped down himself. But for this cause came I to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Hey, in your trouble, in your crucifixions of life, in your being stuffed down in the ground, a place where you may bring forth fruit, Lord, how will you be glorified in this? Lord, glorify your name in this. You know, there's such a mixture of the world in the church in some areas People don't even, they're not even charged to think this way. But the Bible tells us in another place that we're to have this same mind in us when it says about Jesus thought it uh, nothing to be accounted equal to God. And what we talk about there, we won't go into the whole breakdown about that, but we're to have that same mindset in us. He said, for this cause came I into the, the uh, world, so, Father, glorify thy name. Then, in other words, what are we saying? Jesus has accepted what he's here for. Somebody says, well, Jesus couldn't have rejected it because then everything would have been messed up. But as a human being that he was, he could have rejected the will of God. But he chose to obey the will of God. Again, there in the garden, he would do the same thing. If this cup can pass from me, if not, Lord, your will be done. Lord, if I'm going to be crucified here according to your will, then let it be. Amen. Then, because he accepted what the Father had given him, then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. We kind of read it like it was just a nice voice like we are. But to them, it was shocking. It says it thundered. In other words, there was something to this. Others said an angel spoke to him. We read in the scripture, when the angel spoke, men fell down on the ground in fear. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me. Jesus didn't need to know that he was approved of the Father. He walked in that approval. They needed to know that this is him, that he's approved of God. Didn't come for me, but for your sakes. And he says, now is the judgment of this world. Always remember, if somebody says you didn't need the cross, you didn't need the blood, you didn't need a Savior, then the world is exalted. And I mean the world of sin, the world of uh, condemnation, the world of uh, confusion and distress and corruption. It's all exalted. Jesus didn't come to judge us in the flesh. He came to free us. But he came to judge the world. Now is the judgment of this world. And now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Right? In other words, he was ruling and running the world because the Bible says he blinded the minds of them that believed not. He was the God of this world. Jesus at the cross judged the world. And then he goes on to say, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me in John 12, 32. Do you know you would not be walking with the Lord today except for the cross? Amen. Listen, he said, when I'm lifted up, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. It is his death on the cross. Something changed. Amen. The world was judged. And you and I were drawn to the cross and Christ because of what he did. 
Something in us began to say there's more to life. I'm living like a loser and I don't have to live this way. I don't have to give myself to all these things. He gave his life to draw us to the Father, to reconcile us back unto God. This, he said, signifying what death he should die. Remember back there at the Mount of Transfiguration, he was told the death he would die at Jerusalem, the cross, the power of the cross. What did Paul say? Uh, you know, I preach Jesus Christ crucified, he said. Uh, we preach Christ crucified in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 23. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, he said, I determined, remember as wise as Paul was, a scholar in the scriptures, uh, he said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified because there's nothing more important. There's nothing more powerful than what the cross of Christ can do in our lives, Amen. can deliver us from, from sin and wickedness and break the chains of darkness. Amen? Amen? Like I said, I think it was last Sunday, Jesus did so many miracles when he was here in the earth. But when he died on the cross... He's, he was able to set all men free. He might have dealt with 300,000 people when he was here in the earth. Let's say a million. I know that's exaggerated. But the death on the cross from 2,000 years ago has dealt with every man in every generation from then till now until whenever he comes again. Samson was the example of that. He slew thousands of the enemy with the jawbone of an ass. We talked about this last week. But when he stood in the temple with his hands on the pillar and said, Oh, Lord God, remember me. And his hair had begun to grow back as the Nazarite vow was, that that was where his strength was. He pushed those pillars down and the Bible says that he killed more of the enemy in his death than he ever did in his life. Amen. Amen. Hey, you're winning a lot of souls while you're alive. Pray that if you die and go to the grave at your funeral, the cross is preached and people come to Jesus. Or the words that you put out there to people all of a sudden they're looking at you there, and they're thinking, this guy told me about Jesus. This guy told me I needed to stop living the way I'm living. It didn't look good. It didn't sound good. The end of it was no good and changed my life. That we can win more in our death than we ever did in our life. Jesus was an example. Samson was a prelude to it, and you and I could walk in it. So the people answered him. Listen to what they said. Verse 34, the people answered him, we've heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. Listen, and that's what even today they're saying 2,000 years later. Well, if he was the Messiah, he would have lived forever. But he does live forever. He died and rose from the dead, proving who he was to live forevermore and evermore live to make intercession on our behalf, praying for us. He's not just exalted as the king. He's still praying for us to make it through all these things. We heard that he would abide forever. How sayest thou the son of man must be lifted up? They knew what he was talking about now. Who is this son of man? Then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light. Wouldn't it be terrible if all of a sudden the church was shut down? Pastors and preachers and people, you weren't allowed to talk about Jesus anymore? Well, listen, there's a strong possibility that can happen. Amen. You and I better walk in the light while we can, the light of this gospel. 
He meant the light of while he was here with them. But you know what? While we and all of us are here with people, we need to let the light shine. Jesus was the light of the world. He's also the light of the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Well, you have light. Believe in the light. Hold on to these truths. Don't let winds of doctrine change your mindset and draw you astray. Serve the Lord with gladness, the Bible says. If you follow me, what did he say? He said, then you're going to be walking with me, and where I am, you will be. Keep that in mind all the time. These things spake Jesus and departed. Or I'm sorry, walk ye, or while you have the light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. And we lead, read later in the epistles about being the children of the day and not of the night. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. And listen, you can talk to people till you're blue in the face, especially if you're defending your own reputation and self. If they don't want to believe you, they're not going to believe you. Amen. That's just a sad thing about the way a lot of folks are. And so you got to live life and go on. It says, though, that this was for a different reason, that the saying of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? They could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He, God, blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Amen. Okay, so let me just give you a couple things Paul said real quick, and I'm going to let uh, Kennedy, and I should say Matt and Kennedy, male first, man first, uh, come up and share with us about Haiti and the mission. Uh, remember in, let's see, uh, we talked about Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1.23, Paul said we preach Christ crucified, and the fact that it was a stumbling block to the Jews because they wanted a king and a leader. And to the Greeks, it was foolish because the Greeks couldn't understand that they were about the wisdom and the intellect. But he said, Christ is the, it's the power of God and the wisdom of God. So when Paul said we preach Christ, he even said, like I said, in fact, that I determined not to know anything but that preaching and that teaching. Uh, he said in Galatians 2.19, you can write these things down or they should be on there and they're on the list maybe on the internet there or you can follow them. Galatians 2:19 and 20 on down to 21, I believe. It says, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. It's not I that lives, but Christ lives in me. The life that I live now, I don't live after the flesh, but by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself for me. We needed a savior. Jesus paid the price on the cross. Paul said something here that I'll teach on here maybe in the next week or two in verse 21. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. You've heard me talk about this new grace, this hyper grace, this grace covers everything. And we're going to talk about that again, but I'll go from this position instead of others. Galatians chapter 3, just verse 1 and 2. Paul was reprimanding the Galatians. He called them foolish Galatians, and he said, Who's bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? But look at what he says after that. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. What he's saying here is, listen, all of you who've had Christ preach to you and listen to me minister about the death on the cross, it's as though you were there, as though you saw it yourself. And he's saying, don't let go of that. That's what's being done here. He goes on to say, did you receive these things that you know of the spirit or of the works of the law uh, or, or did you receive these uh, 
the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. He's saying, don't go back to the old religious ways. Don't go back, you that were Jew, to the law and say, the law can save me. The law can't save us. The law only revealed our sin. Christ came to save us, the Messiah, Jesus. So he's saying, Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. In other words, we've made it so real to you that you should have no doubt whatsoever that you need a savior, that you needed the cross, you needed the atonement of the blood. And then in, uh, I'll finish with this real quick uh, because it talks about, let me see, in Romans, I believe it is, whoops. Yeah, Romans chapter five, and we'll go down to uh, verse nine. We'll just read nine, 10, and 11. Much more than being now justified by his blood. Listen, without the blood of Christ, there's no justification. There's no right standing. There's no freedom because justified means free, means vindicated, means let out. You were in captivity because of your sins, but you've been freed, you've been justified. He says being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. In other words, if there's no cross, if there's no blood, if there's no death of a sacrifice of Christ, you have the wrath of God to look forward to. Verse 10 says, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, we were enemies of God. His death on the cross, the blood, the atonement brought us at peace with God, reconciled us to the Father. Much more being reconciled now that we're joined together, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement, the remission of our sin, the taking away of our sin. So listen, you have got to either portray Paul as a total heretic and dismantle everything about him and everything he ever taught, which men are working to do right now in major realms. It's all over the internet. It's all over the videos and the teachings and some of these religious schools to try to disavow all of these things. Hold fast to what you learned in the gospel. Amen. The very basic truths that were laid out from before the foundation of the world through our God. Amen? Amen. So this morning, if you're here or if you're out there listening in and you've never allowed Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior, listen. Many of us were in churches. Many of us would have said we were religious. But one day we realized the Bible said we needed a Savior. And that our Savior said we needed to repent of our sin. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is not just to say, I believe, it's to follow him. It's to be where he is, like we talked about in the scripture this morning. That's what the Bible says. No man can see the kingdom except he's born again in John 3, 3. And so in that, it means there's a change. We are born into a new system. It's the kingdom of God, the ways of God, into a new life that's in Christ Jesus, where we are now sons of God and we are children of the Father. And that's what he desires for every one of us. So this morning, if you're out there listening or if you're here, just say, God, I am sorry for all the sins I've committed, the life I've been living. I'm asking you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus came in the flesh that he died on the cross, that he rose again on the third day. I want to be saved. I want to be right. I want to be forgiven. I want your blessings in my life. I want to make it into heaven in the end. You can do that right where you are. God will meet you there. But with that, you need to follow up by getting yourself a Bible. Get yourself in church. Get under a pastor who's going to teach you the right ways of the Lord 
and be around strong, believing Christians who don't just talk about Christianity, but they do what the Bible says and they live it out. And God will bless you there. And you'll be so glad down the road from here that you heard this, you listened to this, and maybe this is just a cap to something else somebody else has been telling you. Maybe your friends, your boss, your family, they've been telling you God can deliver you from drugs. He can deliver you from alcohol. He can heal your broken heart from a divorce or from being uh, in incest relationships or, you know, molested or any of those things. And all these things God forgives and cleanses and he's able to heal. There's nothing too hard for our God. Amen. You may be ravaged in your mind by some torments because of those things but God can touch your mind just like he's done to so many of us and you can be totally set free from that amen thanks for listening this morning and being on with us and I hope you take this word to heart and do something with it and again make sure you ask the Lord to be your savior amen God bless we're gonna start right now and just jump into I'm going to invite Matt and Kennedy to come up in the order that they desire and they're going to share with us a little bit about Haiti and what their plan is uh, in the mission there and so give them a good ear and again just a reminder which I hope you remembered an offering for them okay before they're done amen well thank you for being here we're glad to have you and you go right ahead okay And you, you kind of want it. You can see yourself here. I'll just set this up real quick, but you've got to kind of stand. Just make sure you're in good sight there and go right ahead. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I am Kennedy. This is my husband, Matt. Um, we are missionaries in Haiti. When we are here in the States, we live here in Warren. Um, I want to thank you for having us. It's such a blessing to be here and get to share about the ministry that God is doing through us. I have been living in Haiti for the last four years, teaching at a private Christian school called Morning Star Christian Academy. And Matt has been there for the last year since we got married, um, teaching three boys in an orphanage who needed more one-on-one help with their education than what they could get in the Haitian school system. But this year, God has called us into a different ministry called Loving the Least of These Ministries International. So we're here to share that with you. Our working with this ministry started one Saturday in March. We went to the grocery store and then to our favorite local market. And outside of this market was one of the street boys. These are kids who live on the streets, either because their parents have kicked them out, couldn't afford to keep them, or because they are orphans, or because they ran away from home in one of the provinces and thought they could have a better life in Port-au-Prince, and they've found that that's not the case. Um, But these kids will do anything that they can to make a little bit of money and live for another day. So they will wash your car when you're stopped on the street, or they will... um, help direct traffic or they'll sell things if they can purchase things to sell anything that they can do to get a little bit of money a little bit of a tip and so we see these kids all the time and they've always been on my heart since the first time I came to Haiti and then Matt's heart since I first told him about them while he was still here in the States Um, but this boy for some reason He was different. Um, Can you go to the next slide, please? He looked a lot like the boy in the picture here. I didn't get a picture of him, but he looked like this little boy. And he was selling crackers. I had just bought crackers at the grocery store. I didn't need any more, but I knew I was supposed to buy crackers from him. So I did, and we left. We went back home, and nothing else happened with him. I haven't seen him again. It wasn't this big encounter where Um, we shared anything with him or anything. I just bought crackers, but for the rest of that day, we couldn't get our minds and our hearts off of the street boys. And so we prayed. We were already praying about what we were supposed to do as we were transitioning out of Morning Star. And we prayed and said, God, it feels like you're calling us to work with the street kids, but if you are, we need to know what to do, and we need to know how to do it. 
And that evening, God brought Pastor Tanya Cusey to my mind. Um, she was a friend of mine in Haiti. She had been in Canada for the past couple of years because her husband had cancer, and he has since passed away. But her name came to mind, and I hadn't thought of her for a while. And I remembered that she has a street boys ministry. So I reached out to her. I showed the message to Matt and, um, before I sent it, and sent the message to her and asked, Pastor Tanya, I know you have a street boys ministry. Do you have any room for me and Matt in your ministry? And this is how good God is. Pastor Tanya and her husband Darren had been in Canada, and so they didn't have the boots on the ground, so to speak, in Haiti to be able to run their ministry. It had been running with Haitian leaders, but they had been praying for somebody, missionaries, to step in and be able to help them to run the ministry. When she told her husband about my message and read it to him, he said, you see, Tanya, you've been worrying about this, but God has had a plan all along. He's been working this out. Not only was this an answer to our prayers, but to theirs as well. And we are so eager to get back to Haiti and begin working with loving the least of these. And our main goal is to share hope with the children we work with. Over the past year, as political and economic situations in Haiti have gotten exponentially worse, we've watched a wave of hopelessness fall. This lack of hope can be seen everywhere. Haiti is currently run by 80 gangs and has more kidnappings per person than any other country in the world. To say that life for the Haitian people is hard is such an understatement. For example, I've had one particular Haitian friend since the first time I went to Haiti in 2013. Um, there's a picture of him on the next slide. Thank you. He's always had a bright smile and joy that almost shines out of him, as you can see. Um, but over the past year, he's been so beaten down and discouraged by the gangs and everything going on in Haiti and his one hope has been to get a student visa to the United States. He wants to go to college and study business and then return to Haiti and start a business and be able to share hope with other people by giving them jobs. And this is a great goal. He had everything together. He had the sponsors that he needed in the States. He had the letter of acceptance from the college. He had um, letters of recommendations. He had everything that he needed and he walked into his interview at the U.S. Embassy confident and hopeful, hopeful and he was denied his visa. And I texted him later that day, I asked, I know that your visa appointment is today, how did it go? And he said, not good friend, it's not fair. There was a story not long ago about a father, extremely impoverished. They were running out of food, and he went to his two daughters, and he killed them, and then killed himself, because he didn't want to watch them starve, and he didn't see any other way out. I have a student, Herod, who's 14. He told me one day, whenever I get older, I'm going to move to the States, I'm going to marry a white girl, and we're going to have white babies. And initially, it makes me laugh because he really does not understand genetics. And I had to take the time to show him a picture of our friend's family to show him what biracial kids look like. But when the school day was over, I got to thinking how sad it was because he's seen and heard the things that happen in Haiti. And he's heard of the abundance in the United States. And that's where he sees his hope. There are kids who live in orphanages, or on the street, or in prisons, who have no hope for a better tomorrow except what they might find with the gangs. Even missionaries have been more discouraged over the past year. There are not many missionaries left in the country. Some statistics say that only about a tenth are left of what were there ten years ago. 
And there's a huge gap between the older missionaries with 30 or more years experience and the younger ones like Matt and I with very few in between. The older missionaries tend to have the viewpoint of Haiti is the worst that it's ever been in my however many years of experience. And we've had so many personal friends leave Haiti, not because they had accomplished what they had set out to do, but because the situation seemed hopeless. There are not enough resources. There's no security. There's no fuel. Hospitals are shutting down. People are starving. Gangs have taken over. It's not safe. And on and on. But we have hope. We have an eternal hope. And that hope is Jesus. Jesus not only gives us hope for an eternity with him, but hope for a better life here on earth. When the church does what the church is supposed to do, people find real, tangible hope. James 2, 15 and 16 says, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you tells him, go in peace, stay warm and well fed, but does not provide for his physical needs, what good is that? Matthew 25 talks of those who have fed the hungry, given water to the thirsty, clothed the naked, looked after the sick, and visited the imprisoned, and says when we do these things for others, it's like we've done them for Jesus himself. Matthew 7, 12 is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In addition to helping people with their physical needs, we as Christians are called to be like Christ. He is the light of the world. And in Matthew 5, he tells us that we are the light of the world. He is our Prince of Peace, and we are called to be peacemakers. He is the hope of all mankind, and we are to tell others about our hope. All Christians have this call to be like Christ, but Kennedy and I have been called to go. We've been called to love the least of these, and we've had many opportunities already to share hope with the hopeless. One example was our driver, Ernso. There's a picture of him. We knew that we needed to hire a driver in order to be more safe on the streets in Haiti. Having a Haitian driver would help us to get around um, when there's trouble on the streets. They know um, even the roads that don't show up on Google Maps. And so we knew that that would be a good thing to do and we prayed that God would connect us with someone trustworthy and reliable. And a coworker of mine recommended Ernso, so we reached out to him. It turns out that his wife at the time was six months pregnant and he was so thankful to have a job and be able to provide for his family. We were able to help them by lending them our car when there were troubles with the pregnancy and with the birth and he tells us all the time I don't know what I would have done without you guys without being able to use your vehicle. They were in an otherwise hopeless situation and baby Ernso is now seven months old and they named Matthew um, his godfather. And there are my boys that I teach who have trouble learning and who have seen so many people come and go in their lives to the point that Amber, the missionary who runs the home, warned me that they would probably act out, not form a good connection with me for a while. And she was so surprised that even on the first day that they attached to me, that they attached me so quickly. And I've been blessed with the opportunity to be a stable influence in their lives. Then there are my students, so many of whom I've been able to talk to about who God created them to be and the value that they have in him and about how even when things are falling apart around them, and even when they can't go to school, not because of COVID, but because it's not safe for them to make it from their house to the school. And even when a classmate has been kidnapped and is being held for ransom, God sees 
and he hears and he knows. He is God and he is good. That's a phrase that I use all the time with them Amen. in when I'm praying over them and when I'm just talking to them. He is God and he is good. I was also able to encourage them to use that time that they had at home to draw closer to him. And I still have a weekly Bible study with many of them over Zoom. Um, that's on Sunday nights, and I'll continue that as long as they keep attending. We all get to continue to bring hope through working with loving the least of these. We officially joined in May. Our vision is to equip, educate, and empower people by breaking the cycle of poverty, whereby the individual can reach their full potential in Christ. And our mission is to provide holistic support services for individuals in crisis so that they may be redeemed, restored, and experience radical transformation. In short, we want to share hope with Haiti's youth. Whatever they've done, wherever they've come from, whatever they've gone through, no matter what the situation around them looks like, there is hope. The Loving the Least of These has three branches, an orphanage, a school for potential street children, and a juvenile prison ministry. And here's a short video about each. Our main focus will be on the orphanage. These kids have been through so much in their young lives. They were left for many different reasons in the care of an orphanage. This orphanage was run by an American woman who decided that she was going to leave Haiti and head back to the States. And so she left the kids and the nannies in the house and she didn't return and she stopped sending money and she stopped providing for them. And the nannies, thankfully, decided to stay with the kids and keep helping them. But they ran out of food, and the nannies weren't being paid, and they couldn't purchase more food. And they weren't sure what they were going to do. And my friend, the one from that first picture, um, he somehow came across these kids. And 
he told Pastor Tanya about them, and he said, Pastor Tanya, somebody has to do something. And so Pastor Tanya and her husband Darren set up this orphanage under their ministry, Loving the Least of These. That was about five years ago. Now there are 14 kids. They are well taken care of. They are happy. They are healthy. They um, act like a big, huge family. They get along like siblings. They argue like siblings. They play like siblings. Um, and it's just so much fun to be with them. We got to be with them for a couple of times um, while Pastor Tanya came to visit Haiti before we headed back to the States in June. So at the orphanage, our main job is to build them up physically and spiritually and emotionally and academically to help them reach their full potential in Christ. We'll do this through play, through educational ability testing, and through discipleship and devotionals. And we're so excited about this part of our job. We will look over, we'll also look over grocery lists and make sure that the kids are getting healthy meals. We will send in financial reports and do other administerial work like that. The second branch of the ministry, SWAG School, stands for Saved with Amazing Grace. In SWAG School, the 50 students come from homes where the parents don't have enough money to provide them with food, let alone an education. And therefore, they're at risk for being put out on the street to fend for themselves. And it's so important to keep them off the street because street children are more likely to be raped killed, or taken in by a gang. And we'll be helping the teachers with resources to be able to better teach the students. Haiti's school system is largely based on memory, which means kids come out of the school not understanding what they've learned. We want to make sure these kids are equipped for life. The school currently runs on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays with the Kids Church of 150 kids on Saturdays. And each day, the kids get a meal, which is sometimes the only meals that they get in a week. In the juvenile prison, we will be sharing a meal and the gospel with the inmates. Loving the least of these began going to the prison when they heard that the kids were running out of supplies. What would you do if you were in a cell that was made for 10 people but it was crammed of about 20. And then everybody ran out of toothpaste. And then everybody ran out of toilet paper. And then everybody ran out of food. These are the things that happen because of the corruption in the Haitian government. These prisoners, these children, are not properly taken care of. So we currently go about once a month and we're hoping to go more as the ministry expands. Please pray for these kids. It's so easy to write them off and say that they're terrible, hopeless people, but they've grown up literally living on the streets. They've talked to gang leaders who promise them a better life in the gangs. All you have to do is go and kill this person. All you have to do is go and block this road and We'll provide for you and we'll give you a family here in the gang. We'll make sure that you're fed and that you have clothes to wear. It sounds like an okay deal if you're a kid on the street spending for yourself. Gangs will gladly take the kids in knowing that that does sound like a good deal to them. And these kids, they find themselves in the gang and then in the prison and where is their hope? They need to know that there is not hope in the gangs, Katsamalozo, or Shemeshan, or Lavalas. They need to know that they will only find hope in Jesus Christ. We want to share the hope with Christ with them so that when they get to, the, when they get to leave prison, they'll be able to change Haiti for the better and share that hope with others. And when their time is up and they leave this earth, they have the hope of eternity with Christ. So the story that we have while we are there, the loving the least of these leaders had it on their hearts 
to take food to the prison and share the gospel with the kids. Whenever Pastor Tanya was visiting us in Haiti, they were planning to go on a Saturday, and they bought all the supplies that they would need on Thursday. And on Friday, as, as we're standing looking at the supplies in the garage waiting to be taken to the prison, the very next day we get a phone call, and it was the prison. Can you please come? We ran out of food to feed the kids. They have nothing to eat. That's how God works. He orchestrates stories and lives and pulls at hearts and changes minds and guides feet so that Matt and I are in the perfect position to step out in faith and ask Pastor Tanya if her ministry has room for us. And so that Pastor Tanya and the ministry are in the perfect place to be contacted by my friend to re rescue these abandoned orphans. And so that food is ready, sitting there in the garage, ready to be taken to kids who just ran out of food and we didn't even know. And so that there are people and churches willing to support the ministry that we're doing in Haiti. We want to thank Church at Warren for supporting our ministry. It's encouraging to see churches that are sold out for the gospel. We would also like to give you some ways you can support us in prayer. The first way is to pray that we can continue to adapt the Haitian culture and language because the better we understand, the better we can help. The next four really go together. We need wisdom in ministry and the ability to return soon, and Haiti needs an end to gang violence. One thing hindering us from leaving for Haiti is support. We are $25,000 a month, sorry, $2,500 a month, that's a big difference, <laughs> behind our monthly need. The other is the gang wars that are currently happening in Haiti. I was just talking to my friend about what was going on. I heard about gangs in her area, so I checked in on her, and she said, I don't know if there's anybody who doesn't have gang wars in their area right now. Almost the entire capital is a war zone, and on top of that, there's no gas or diesel in the country. This means no internet, little communication, hospitals closing, and people dying of that, grocery stores closing, people starving. It's devastating. Please pray for peace in Haiti, wisdom for us and when to go back, and how to handle things once we get there and protection for us and the people we know and love there. We were planning on going back at the beginning of October, um, but we had to move that date back, both because of support and because of what's going on right now. We are hoping that we'll be able to get back at the beginning of November. And finally, please pray for the hope in the hearts of the children that we minister to. Haiti is a war zone, but we want them to know the hope and peace that comes through Jesus Christ. We'll leave you with Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you <coughs> shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you guys for sharing with us. And of course, we want to bless you as you go. Uh, so what we're going to do, if you fellas at the back there, this will be a little different, but if you'll just go ahead and put on that music of the old rugged cross, and we will do tithes and offerings at the same time here with the offering for the crosses as they go. Uh, Lord, we ask you to bless our tithes as we come and bless the offering. Uh, for Haiti, in Jesus' name, we thank you and give you all the praise and glory. Amen. Amen. And for the rest of us, we'll be signing off here. So thank you for being with us today. God bless. <laughs>